Hello everyone, I'm Steve and welcome to All Things Architecture, the show telling the stories behind the buildings and the people who created them. Now, on with our story. It was a clear Friday evening in 1980. Frank Gehry was hosting a small dinner with his wife Berta in their relatively new house in Santa Monica. Their guest was Matthias DeVito, chief executive of the Rouse Company, one of the country's top mall developers, and Frank's client. Now, Frank's firm had designed several important buildings for the Rouse Company, including their headquarters in Columbia, Maryland. And they had just recently completed the nearby Santa Monica Place shopping mall. Now, the mall was designed in the postmodern style, which included pastel colors and strong rectangular forms. From its opening until its eventual renovation some 30 years later, the building was panned for being rather basic. Now, for everyone that knows the name Frank Gehry today, it might be hard to believe they would have ever designed something so average. But the first 20 years of his career were just that. His buildings were mostly understated. However, on this Friday evening, a conversation would take place that would change his career forever. The moment in which Frank Gehry became the Frank Gehry we know today. DeVito arrived at Frank's house, which was located at the end of an average Santa Monica street. He got out of the car and stood on the sidewalk. His eyes widened as he was taken back by the sight, and his mouth was agape as he stared at a traditional 1920s Dutch colonial house being enveloped by a mass of corrugated metal emerging out of the ground to create striking crystalline forms. There was also chain-link fencing caging the front of the house, it was essentially two houses in one. DeVito's eyes kept darting back and forth at the strange composition. Under his breath he said, Wow, what is this place? He wondered how anybody could possibly live in such a place. But for Gary and his family, it was rather easy. Even if it tested the patience of some of Gary's neighbors, who saw it as an eyesore at first. To Gary, though, it wasn't an eyesore at all, but a bold architectural statement. He was simply using the materials that were found all over the place, like chain-link fencing, plywood, and corrugated metal, and turning them into architecture. And while the house had its critics, many who visited Gary's house, including DeVito, were intrigued by it, and always seemed to walk away saying, Wow. He entered the house and was greeted by a 51-year-old Gary with his black-rimmed glasses and a large mustache. The interior of the house was just as startling as the exterior. The living room looked more like a construction site rather than a living room. There was exposed studs and mismatched furniture. He walked into the kitchen and watched, in the reflection of the oddly placed window, the moon rising from the west and cars driving upside down. It was a surrealist dream, he thought, and he couldn't figure out how the same man who designed the perfectly average run-of-the-mill shopping center across town could possibly come home to such a house. So as dinner concluded, Geary and DeVito picked up their conversation in the living room. Now, Geary and DeVito have given several accounts of this conversation, but essentially, sometime during the conversation, DeVito, looking around the living room with its exposed studs, asked Geary bluntly, Do you like it here? You'd have to. I do, replied Geary. Well, then, if you like this place, there's no way you could possibly like Santa Monica Place. Geary paused and replied quietly, you're right, I don't. Then why did you do it? questioned DeVito. Because I had to make a living. And DeVito shot back, Well, stop it. You have a different purpose in life. Any architect can design office buildings and shopping malls. You should be designing museums and music halls. That's what you'd be good at. Geary thought for a moment. And he realized maybe DeVito was right. While he was having success with commercial developers for close to 20 years now, he never felt fulfilled by these projects. He realized it was the smaller projects, like the design he did for his very own house and for the house he designed for Ron Davis a decade prior. Those were fulfilling because they were challenging architecture, breaking the norm and allowing him to explore his own architectural language. Unlike other architects, finding their architectural voice in the works of Mies van der Rohe, Geary was finding his voice in art specifically with the art and artists in Los Angeles's thriving art community. That's where Geary's heart was. 
He wanted to explore different materials, materials not typically associated with buildings, and using them in his work. And most of all, Geary was wanting to create buildings that made people go wow, and he knew his work right now wasn't doing that. And so that night, DeVito and Geary came to an agreement to cancel all their current projects and to go their separate ways. Now, whether DeVito's conversation was a kind way of letting Geary know that his time with the Rouse Company was coming to an end, no one can be sure. In Sidney Pollock's documentary about his life, Geary described the feeling like he was jumping off a cliff. Geary didn't even know if there were going to be clients willing to build his kind of architecture. It seemed like career suicide. But the leap of faith would pay off. Gary would take the advice of DeVito and go on to make people go wow all over the world. First, he began right in his hometown with buildings like the Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, which took the framework of a university and broke it down into abstraction. His next stop would take him international to Germany with his Vitra Museum in 1989. It was here where Gary's architecture began to find its voice, in the form of a mixture of boxes and curves, to create a bold statement. But it was his museum in the heart of Bilbao, Spain in 1997 that would cause the entire world to go wow, and make Frank Gehry the world's most famous architect. In the Guggenheim Bilbao, Gehry blended flowing metallic forms within the traditional architecture of the city. He used titanium for the Guggenheim, which was rarely used in construction. The titanium was one of those risks that paid off. It played with the light and caused the building to come alive and shimmer under the Spanish sun. A few years later, Gary would return to Los Angeles to complete the work on the Walt Disney Concert Hall in 2003. This time, stainless steel created comforting curves that resembled sails on a boat. It was a rough fight to get the building completed, as contractors denied it could even be built. But Gary persisted. Once it was built, it was an instant icon. And even today, Gary's buildings continue to break new ground and shock the world. And to think it was all due to a conversation that inspired a leap of faith to follow a passion. A passion for challenging what architecture can be, and making people go, wow. We hope you enjoyed our story. For more interesting stories about architecture and the people who created it, consider subscribing to Architecture by Design. And if you're looking for more content on the best of architecture from around the world, visit arcbydesign.com. I'm Steve. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.